Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> and I trust everyone can hear me. Uh, for my introduction of our keynote speaker today, I thought it only fair to have a more aesthetically pleasing Zoom background rather than your traditional alternative, which is not very pretty. So please take a few seconds to say hello to the Mackenzie River. I wanna thank John Potter for stitching these video segments together so masterfully. The Mackenzie River video background is as much for our keynote speaker as it is for you, the audience, because if this weren't a virtual conference, she would have been a special guest of ours. That is my wife, Trish and me, our two dogs and three cats here on the Mackenzie. Now that our background is set, I'll proceed with my introduction. The notable uh, Russian playwright, short story writer and physician, Anton Chekhov, offered the following advice in a letter to his older brother, Alexander, who had literary ambitions of his own. <clears throat> he said, don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. Your keynote speaker today, Dr. Marianne Wolf, will spare you the pedestrian observation that the moon is shining. She will instead inspire you to take ardent notice of the moon's gracious celestial bearing in our daily lives, but especially the light it infuses in our poetry and ourselves as educators committed to what is best for all children. <clears throat> in doing so, she will reveal what, why the glint of light on broken glass, namely children's failure to negotiate the alphabetic writing system of our English language, requires our clear-eyed commitment to the scientific research on reading, coupled with our enduring attention to the choices we make when delivering and supporting reading instruction, both technically and generatively, especially to children most vulnerable to the written symbolic system. All of it critical to the role of literacy and social justice, a role the Oregon Response to Instruction Intervention has long recognized and does so again today with its invitation of Dr. Wolf to keynote this conference. She will also alert you to the vulnerability of children's deep reading engagement in an age unwittingly entrenched in digital communication devices and forms that potentially distract and detract from the unlit depths of English language, of the English language. As John Stuart Mill reminds us, Language is the light of the mind. In a recent book published in 2018, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World, Dr. Wolf cites one of my favorite poets and Oregon's former poet laureate, William Stafford, when she asks, will our quality of attention and reading, the basis of the quality of our thought, change inexorably as our culture transitions away from a print-based culture toward a digital one? For at least four decades now as neuroscientist, as a reading researcher, a curriculum developer, a former teacher in Wailua, Hawaii, no less, and an advocate for children and literacy around the world, Dr. Wolf has earned the field's deep and unflinching respect because of her insightful analysis and understanding of the importance of reading in the brain. She has the uncanny and, un and seemingly unnatural ability to write about it clearly, compellingly, and with glinty eloquence. Again, in her book, Reader Come Home, Dr. Wolf doesn't merely name the parts of the reading circuit in the reading brain and identify their endowed but stealthy functions. She invokes Emily Dickinson, Neil Tolstoy, and even Coldplay in offering the reader a, what she terms as a visual metaphor for how, quote, a reading circuit incorporates input from two hemispheres, four lobes in each hem hemisphere, frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital, and all five layers of the brain, end quote, in direct service of vision, language, cognition, motor, and effect effective functions. I trust by now you're on to me and have figured out that this is less an introduction than it is a panegyric, a public offering in praise of someone, even though that someone, especially your keynote speaker, Dr. Marianne Wolf, does not seek such praise. In fact, she generally hides from it and is quick to redirect it to the broader professional community, especially those on the front line, like many, if not most of you. So let me ease up on the conspicuous praise and get to professional and personal facts about Dr. Wolf. 
Marianne is currently professor in residence in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies and director of the Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners and Social Justice at UCLA. She received her doctorate in the Department of Human Development and Psychology in the Graduate School of Education at Harvard in 1979. She received her undergraduate degree in English literature from St. Mary's College of Notre Dame, Indiana. As an aside, another notable alumna of St. Mary's is Mary Ellen Quinlan O'Neill, the mother of one of my favorite playwrights, Eugene O'Neill. Mm -hmm. In recognition of the first order principles that she established at her undergraduate alma mater, which served to guide her life's work, St. Mary's College of Notre Dame in, oh, awarded Dr. Wolf recently with an honorary doctoral degree. What a distinct honor. She earned her master's degree from Northwestern University, again in English literature. Prior to accepting her current faculty appointment at UCLA for more than two decades, she was a joint John DiBiagio Professor of Citizenship and Public Service at Tufts University and the director of the Center for Reading and Language Arts. Dr. Wolf has published more than 160 scientific articles and the is the author of the Ravo Reading Intervention for Children with Dyslexia and co-author with Martha Denkla of two naming speed tests, which serve as major predictors of dyslexia across languages. She's the author <clears throat> of Proust and the Squid, The Story and the Science of the Reading Brain, published by HarperCollins in 2007, which is now, by the way, published in 13 languages. She's also author of Dyslexia, Fluency in the Brain, by York Publishing, which was published in 2001. Tales of Literacy for the 21st Century, published by Oxford University Press in 2016. And of course, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World, published by HarperCollins in 2018. Since 2000, she and her colleagues have procured more than 22 million in private and public research funds. Not surprisingly, Dr. Wolf has many, many honors and awards in fact, too many to name, so I'll highlight a few, including, for example, the Walter Ong Award received in 2020 for Career Achievement and Scholarship, the Chapman University Presidential Fellow, the Reading League's Benita Blackman Award for Applying Research into Practice, the Norman Geshwin Memorial Lecture Award and Samuel Orton Award both represent the highest honors from the International Dyslexia Association, the Massachusetts Distinguished Teacher of the Year Award is Psychology for the Massachusetts Psychological Association. The Eminent Researcher of the Year Award from Lear for Learning Disabilities from Australia. And both the Alice Garside Award and the Windward Researcher of the Year Award for research on dyslexia. She shares the NICHD Shannon Award for innovative research with her colleagues, Maureen Lovett and Robin Morris. In 2013, she also received the Christopher Columbus Award for Intellectual Discovery for her work as co-founder of Curious Learning, a global literacy initiative with deployment in Africa, India, Australia, and rural United States. She is also the recipient of the Einstein Award from the Dyslexia Foundation. On two separate occasions, she served as fellow and research affiliate at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. She is currently working with members of the Dyslexia Center in the University of California at San Francisco School of Medicine and the faculty at Chapman University on issues related to dyslexia. <clears throat> she is also a research advisor to the Canadian Children's Literacy Foundation. Now, lest you think she privileges only literacy, dyslexia, and social justice, her talents are thoroughly fungible and pecuniary as she is also an external advisor to the International Monetary Fund. Finally and importantly, she was recently appointed for life as a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. As a result of this appointment, not only does she have a direct line to the Pope, but she also sits in the enduring historical and moonlit glow of the Academy's very first leader, Galileo Galilei. As the only friend of Dr. Marion Wolf, <clears throat> Mary Ann Wolf, who is an admitted sinner, this is as close as I'll ever get to an association this theologically and scientifically profound and intimate. As you can clearly discern that a man on Dr. Wolf's time are breathtakingly unforgiving. However, she still makes time for little Mendelssohn, Chopin, Sibelius at the piano, often late at night, but to re really relax and to honor her undergraduate roots at St. Mary's Notre Dame, 
She often rereads the Summa Theologica, the best known work of Thomas Aquinas. It's a singular privilege to introduce your keynote speaker who is reading research and neuroscience royalty, but this royalty enjoys the rare talent of being an extraordinary thinker and writer, one who boldly draws on her deep literature, musical, theological roots to conjure up provocative, thoughtful, and artful ideas and images in her technical writing. I consider her one of the most gifted, important thinkers and writers of her time. That said, however, you will need to pay keen attention. After all, the images when presented auditorily, which is a weak and fluttering signal of meaning, offer only a glint of light and sound. Such and such glints are rare and fleeting, like our keynote speaker. In deference to the Mackenzie River, please join me in giving Dr. Marion Wolf a roaring Mackenzie River greeting and welcome. Whoa. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I am very rarely speechless, but I am right now. That is the most beautiful, uh, most lyrical, um, the most touching introduction I've ever had. Leave it to our Hawaiian Ed Kamei Mui to summon such beauty. And I can't, I can't thank you enough, Ed, but also you completely calmed me with this McKinsey River. It just makes me so happy. But now I must go to my professional self and simply thank so many of you for coming. Um, I looked at the chat and you're from all over the country and even the world. That makes me so happy that we can together share this information. I wanna thank John Potter who worked for a year to get all of this arranged and of course to Brad and Christy and to all of you who are participating, including some of my dear friends who are in the panel, and Anita Archer, whom I last saw, I think, in Australia, trying to spread the message of literacy there. And that's what I'm going to be doing, um, even though I think after Ed's talk, I'm, I'm actually getting a little shy. I feel a little bit more like Emily Dickinson, who would have said after such an introduction, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's two of us, don't tell. How dreadful to be somebody, how public like a frog, to say your name the live long day to an admiring bog. Well, you are hardly an admiring bog. I am an admirer of everyone who is spending time at this conference to do our best, to do our very best to make knowledge come alive in our classroom. So now I'm going to do a share screen and we are going to have um, an excursion into the reading brain and how information about the reading brain can inform us in ways that, that you may not have suspected, but that I hope in fact inspire you. Um, to understanding how our science, how our neuroscience and education are true partners for us who are educators. So I will be putting together, as Ed said, um, both science and poetry and my reflections on it as, um, as an educator who has one overarching mission. Um, as you know, I am at UCLA now instead of the East Coast Tufts University, which I loved. Uh, but I am here with a mission that I have never felt after all these years, I've never felt so strongly. We are closer than ever to accomplishing this mission of making literacy a human right in every zip code, everywhere, in every country. Um, and if you, um, if you think about why you're here, it's my great joy and responsibility 
to help you begin this excursion of knowledge. And we're going to begin with the brain and how it learned to read um, and move into not just how the reading brain develops, but what are the impediments that we call dyslexia as a whole, but in fact is a, um, if, if, if you will, its own continuum of different impediments inside that reading circuit that cause it to have a disadvantage for reading while having advantages for other areas. So um, the, what I most hope in this overview is to use the reading brain as a way of understanding not just dyslexia, but how do we use our information about dyslexia to help all children who struggle to read for all kinds of reasons. And as all of you know, an emphasis is this, um, this, if you will, understanding that we are working not just for education, but to see education as a platform for social justice and to see our knowledge on the reading brain and dyslexia as a way, as a, as a, as, as a place in which knowledge can reach all struggling readers wherever they are. And I will be spending two-thirds, three-fourths of my talk with you on those issues. But the very last part of my talk may come as a surprise. I have become, if you will, um, an advocate of understanding the impact of, dig of the digital world on what we do, on, on how our, our children are learning and indeed on how it impacts us. And finally, and perhaps most surprisingly, I am going to confront with you the fact that our digital culture has implications for our democracy. So it's a, a big picture and little pictures inside that, that I hope to give. And, and true to form, as Ed said, I'm always quoting one poet after our novelist after another. Well, Kurt Vonnegut, Vonnegut uh, talked about how artists were the canaries in our minds, alerting us to the toxic forces in our environment. And I liken reading to a canary in the mind because I know and, and want you to have even a more uh, expanded, poignant understanding of this, literacy. Reading changes the brain. It changes the individual, which changes the society, which changes the future of our species. Now, after saying that, I want to also say that all of this has begun to change as we use different mediums to read and that digital culture has both these extraordinary gifts to give us, the extraordinary expansion of knowledge, the rapidity of knowledge, the access to knowledge, but it also has perils that we must understand. And I will say this twice, Sherry Turkle, and I'll, I'll use her again later, but I want to, to, uh, to begin even the talk about the reading brain to say that we, we who are, are in this digital culture are being affected in ways we don't understand. And it is understanding those differences that will help the system redress its own weaknesses. So there's no binary here. It's rather like Sherry Turkle. We look at the innovative for not only what it does, but for what it disrupts and diminishes. So we have quite a story ahead of us um, because we are, if you will, at the edge of a hinge moment as we move, um, just as we moved into an oral culture um, from a non-oral culture, we're now only probably 200,000 years ago, but, and though that, that's, that's all, that, 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 that year is always changing a little bit, but we moved into this written culture only barely at a blink of an evolutionary eye, barely 6,000 years ago. And yet in only two, three decades, 
we have moved from this literate culture ever more into a digital culture. There are things we must know about that transition. And we can, um, if in this talk, and there will be so many beautiful talks. I was looking at all my friends from Nancy Young and Jan and Chili Washington. All these people are doing these wonderful talks today. I wish I could be with all of you. But the reality is this talk is connecting neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, to education. Now, why? I used Stanislas Dehan to help me say this. He, he's far more eloquent than I've ever been. He, he says that parents and educators must have a better understanding of what reading changes in a child's brain. I am convinced that increased knowledge of these circuits will greatly simplify the teacher's task. That's why I was asked to, to speak to you this morning, because I want to help you use knowledge to simplify your ta the task of teaching, the, not just the task, the responsibility, the gift, the opportunity of teaching every child to read. Well, this begins with what I call an origin story of our reading brain. And it begins with the almost oversimple fact that the human brain was never born to read. It was born to think. It was born to, to run, to eat, to see, to listen, to talk but there's not a single genetic program for reading, which means we get, uh, in essence, a lesson in what the brain does when it learns some new cognitive function like numeracy or literacy. It creates a new circuit out of the older parts. So what, what is happening in the reading brain is that we have a way of connecting, using this brain design principle, of connecting all these very important regions that were and are genetically programmed. So what reading is, is basically an understanding that the brain can make a new circuit, but, and here's, there's, that's the Achilles strength, the Achilles heel, but that circuit will be plastic. Now, the implications of a plastic reading brain are really well illustrated just simply by looking at the fact that our reading brain is changed according to the writing system, according to how we educators teach that reading brain, but it's also according to the right, uh, excuse me, the way we read on the medium. Now, if you look very quickly, those of you who speak or read Chinese or Japanese, you are employing not similar regions as an alphabet, but also different ones. Now, the only reason why I tell you this, and I have written about it for all these different years, is that it shows we don't have one reading brain. We have a plastic reading brain circuit that's going to um, reflect and represent what are the environmental demands on it? Now, there are certain, if, if you will, I, I, I go much, a little too fast, there are certain things that we really want to understand about how that reading brain develops. Now, there's something that is a, a little hard for me to, um, if you will, accept as a, uh, not just as a, a, a neuroscientist, but as a citizen. There is a tale here of two childhoods in how that reading develops. And I, I want to go through just a few of them, but the reality is that our childhood, our time from zero to five is so very important because what we are doing is we are building the parts of the circuit. And I, I use the acronym often in my teaching of possum. We are building phonemes and the prosody contour. The baby is actually imitating your melody by two months. But we are giving so much when we talk and read to our children. But especially for later on, we are building a base for the phonemes to be represented. And whatever that first language is, I know Lillian Durant in Oregon is doing so much great work on this. Whatever first language it is, that is so important to represent. It's phonemes. 
it's 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 meaning so if you see if you just look at this this picture of the circuit all these parts are are being used and being developed but i want to also really talk about very briefly about how important it is that we understand as parents and educators and citizens that between zero and five every book read to a child is adding to not just the phoneme representation but the representation of meanings of children now i look at this slide which is you know i've i've shown this particular slide maybe a thousand times and there's this is showing quantitative data that keeps being replicated but it's also replicated qualitatively at the by john gabrielli and others at his lab by by all kinds of people who understand that the more we read, the more we talk to our children, the more the representations of those words, if you will, in glorious term, sticks. We have to have this exposure to word after word after word. And what we see here in this slide, replicated over and over, is that our children of privilege, our children who have more advantages. This is not only about money, but it ought, too often is an economic issue. They are hearing the same, the same repertoire of words over and over and over again, so that by the time they're three, four, and five, there's a gap of how many times they've heard these words of over 30 million words difference. Now, those parts of the brain which I showed you are being used. They are being developed in the zero to five period, and they are developing in our children at, at this enormous pace, or they are not. And here's where so many of our children, um, if, you, if you look at this slide, this, this huge gap, so many of our children who come from families who do not understand these principles, are, who are doing three jobs and aren't speaking to their children, all the, all the time, much less reading to them at night, there is a difference in the representation of language and even the activation of language regions. And Stanovich said this about vocabulary, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. But that's also the case because words aren't just words. Words are connected to concepts. Concepts are connected to background knowledge. And when children come to age five in kindergarten, they don't necessarily come with the same amount of representations. We have to change this. This is a source of inequity. It's another also, it's another source of what the learning gap that we talked and, and worked so hard, that learning gap doesn't begin in kindergarten, it begins in zero to five. And my colleagues like John Hutton at Cincinnati and others who are doing pediatric neuroimaging they can show us what happens when children are being read to every night versus children who are not. And this is not about money. These are studying children who are coming from lower SES backgrounds and just looking at the differences in activation in the language regions of the brain for those kids who are read to. And what you see is that the more the child's read to, the more those, uh, those, act, those regions are activated not only for receptive knowledge, but also for expressive. So we're giving so much, um, and the, my, my colleagues in Reach Out and Read the Pediatric um, uh, Society, they are giving well visit books and helping parents understand that even at three months, six months, we are giving so much. And, and, and parents who say, oh, but they don't understand a word. Ah, that's not the point. They are growing their understanding of the components of language. So we really have to understand how important it is that these parts of the brain in the zero to five period are being developed so that we who teach, we can help connect it. That's what reading is. That's what the first circuit is. It's a connection among all those beautiful parts, phonology, orthography, learning how the words work on a, on a book, learning what letters are, all of these things are giving us the stuff of the parts. Now, what we are doing here in this slide is just showing you in a very rough way that that, that 
those first five years are really, if you look at those first five brains, are really developing the parts. I, as an educator, and when I taught in Waialua, <laughs> unsuccessfully, by the way, I, that's the reason why I left English literature, by the way, at Kamei Nui, is because I failed too many children in Waialua because I didn't know any of this. This is, in fact, why I am here today is because of those kids, the Onehas, the, oh my goodness, I, can't, I remember their names. I remember their names. But the point is, zero to five is developing those first parts of the brain. The orthographic recognition, the vision, the learning what what the words say the, the, on the page. All of this is happening with all these language processes. And we, we connect them. Now, those who are talking about foundational skills, as I have for years and years, we have been emphasizing the systematic, explicit teaching of those parts being connected. But what I'm going to in, invite you to think about is that our major job is connecting all of those parts. And we don't do a service. And here's what's really going to be um, important to emphasize. We do no service if we are only emphasizing one set of those parts. We have to also be talking about the meanings. And here's where um, I'm going to enter very, very briefly um, what is the most unnecessary war there ever was between those who are uh, emphasizing phonics versus those who are emphasizing only meaning or authentic literature. The idea of the foundational skills should not be a moment of, of separation, but a moment of understanding that those foundational skills, learning the alphabetic principle, are absolutely necessary for meaning. And that is when we, when we connect the alphabetic principle, phoneme awareness, understanding of what, what phonics does so well, understanding how all those parts have to become automatic, but they also have to be automatically connected to meaning, to syntax, to how words use in sentence. We really need explicit, systematic everything, and no cherry picking. One of the, the, the hardest things that I, I'm going to say to some of you is that balanced reading is, it has the greatest name and unfortunately is not implemented in the way that I am talking about. There can't be cherry picking, a little phonics or a little meaning. We want them connected. We want real, a really comprehensive understanding of what foundational skills are. They are all those parts and it's so important for us to, to realize we have to work on all of those parts systematically. That's our job and connect it so the child becomes fluent, especially before grade four. Now, part of my, 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 my worry about this talk is that I could spend too much time on these two brains, and I can't do that today because of time, but I know the other speakers are going to be really talking to you about how important all this understanding of foundational skills and how we teach it is especially Anita, who does such a great job. But what I want to do is to connect it to the deep reading processes. These are the processes that unite us all. They are what Proust said is the heart of reading, which is to leave the wisdom of the author behind and discover our own. But how do we do that? We do that because we learn multiple, what I call deep reading processes. We learn how to bring the background knowledge. Remember, zero to five. We need, just like Connie Jewell said, to be sure that the child, after they decode it, know the meaning, know what it stands for, know the concepts. Well, the deep reading processes are learning to pull these ever more sophisticated cognitive processes together when we read. Now, we have to be fluent. We have to have those foundational skills really automatic and fluent so that we add all the beauty of literature, the poetry, if you will. Deep reading processes represent a convergence of what we know and what we don't know, but can infer and think about and reflect over. This is the, the development of an elaborated expert reading brain, and it includes empathy. This is something that is so often neglected 
not only is reading about thinking, it's about feeling. And every frog and toad, every Charlotte's Web, every character who helps you, the child, as a child, leave yourself behind, pass over into the perspective of others. That is the basis of our moral laboratory. That is the basis of what Martha Nussbaum calls the compassionate imagination. Fiction in particular increases empathy and there's such wonderful work by our Canadian colleagues. But I actually want to give you um, a shadow of this. What happens when we aren't readers? And Jane Smiley once said that the novel's not going to die, but it could be sidelined. And if it is, we will have people who lead us who are not readers and who never understand truly the perspective of others. And our former President Barack Obama, in a beautiful interview, I hope some of you read with novelist Marilyn Robinson, said, you are an ambassador of empathy. Fiction is what has taught me that the novel, your novels, have taught me the difference about what it means to leave yourself and, and understand other. And what she said is a memorable line for today. For this moment in time in our overpolarized country and overpolarized world, the trend towards seeing those different as sinister other is the greatest danger to continuing our democracy. This is a talk about cognitive neuroscience and reading brain. It is a talk about democracy too. How reading prepares the mind to take on other perspectives. But it does something else that is critical. And I use the word critical very carefully here. We must have children who by fourth grade are proficient enough to be able to learn how to use their background knowledge and inference and become critical thinkers. And so many of our children enter fourth grade unable to do that when the workload has increased, the teachers have not been trained to teach a reading if they assume that. So much goes on when we do not realize how important fluency is, fluent comprehension, before fourth grade. What happens in this developing deep reading brain is that we learn, after we become fluent, to take all this knowledge and be critically analytic. And that's something that happens, that we help teach our children over time to connect what is known, to make inferences, about the truth value. Herein lies a social justice issue. Our children have to know the difference between information, disinformation, and misinformation, intentional information. We are, when we are deep reading, learning to exert the time, and I'm using the word time very carefully, exert enough time to think, is this true? What do we know that refutes it or supports it? And then finally, going back and forth, this frontal dance, we have an imprimatur on truth. This has never been more important than this moment in our history, of, in our society. The sum of it all is what, again, my, this novelist, Marilyn Robin, is so important to me. She and Gish Jen are, are, have given me so much understanding of what it means to read. But this is what Marilyn Robinson said about this moment in the reading brain when we are bringing empathy and critical analysis together. I call it the Proustian pause. I call it that because it's the time to do what Marilyn Robinson said. If God has taken pleasure in his creation, it is in your best idea, your most disciplined thinking on whatever is true, honorable, just, pleasing, and worthy of praise. Worthy of praise. This is what our reading brain is at its apex. Your brain, my brain, our children's brain. This is what we wanted to do. We wanted to have the capacity to bring all those sophisticated deep reading processes together to think, and that's why I call it the Proustian pause, to think for themselves and to really not be led into silos of the familiar information the way so much of society is now going. Now, I use Thomas Aquinas, not because of the Pontifical Academy of Science, but because Thomas Aquinas symbolizes for me probably the best reader that ever was. He once said he was most grateful in life 
with the fact he understood everything he ever read. That will never happen for me or for you or for all those we teach, but we can teach them to read so that they think. And what what uh, Thomas was Thomas Aquinas was saying is, we must hand on to others the things gained in contemplation. And that's what I want for our children, that sanctuary where they can go in reading, where they learn how to have this, this inner self, this inner sanctum in which they can have a pause and they can think for themselves. But that requires not just milliseconds of the brain, it takes years to develop. So we who are so, we are so dedicated to teaching that, that child, that, that child to read, to acquire reading, but we need to achi- uh, have uh, the acquisition of deep reading for our society. It is never a given. And for many of our children, and here I will spend um, just a few minutes with you about things that other speakers will be speaking long and hard and beautifully about, but I, I want to connect what I've just said to the brain's organization that is different. And, and now remember, we have about the same brain for the last 50,000 years, and we've only learned to read in about the last 6,000 years. That dyslexic brain has been there a long time. And why? As Gordon Sherman once said, it's because we need the cerebral diversity so that we have different brain organizations who will, and many of you know all this, but so many of our arts, artists, architects, entrepreneurs, scientists, inventors have these brains that are organized and advantaged for thinking outside the boxes that so many like myself um, are, are living within. Now, I want you to just quickly look that there's one name under this artist that you don't know. We'll come back to it. He's an LA artist and, and I, we'll, we'll say one word or two about him, but just a three minute look at the person who I think is the most likely dyslexic that is not included in our list, and that's Leonardo da Vinci. I don't think there's anyone who was ever more able to think outside the box, but who had this constellation of interesting weaknesses in word retrieval, could never learn Latin, had he always wanted somebody else to read to him. He couldn't go to the, the school for, um, for an avocat, a, a lawyer, because he couldn't learn Latin. Um, he was terrific in geometry, but not algebra. Well, excuse me. These are just some of the reasons why when we look at dyslexia, we are really talking about a constellation of strengths and weaknesses. And I think uh, Da Vinci's particular um, form, especially, remember, he's Italian. And when an Italian can't learn Latin, there are really interesting issues in that word retrieval system. Well, I won't go into it except to use his example as a way of saying our, our children, our individuals, our adults with the dyslexia have a constellation of these strengths and weaknesses. And we need to have a new conceptualization of dyslexia. Now, uh, if you look at that person on the left, that is a L.A. artist named Ben Wolf Noam. He's also my son. And I have much of this, especially when we get to intervention, was inspired by understanding the heterogeneity of dyslexia. And I always use this, this psalm to myself over the years. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And that is the case with so many of our children that they have feelings of rejection. No matter what, no matter who Ben's mother was, he felt rejected for many a time. And that rejection taught me so much about the feelings that we must prevent by early prediction, by screening, um, so that we can look at the full range of, of, the, of the beautiful advantages and, and disadvantages um, that are clearly there in our dyslexia brain organization. But it's a different organization that's being studied so much by my colleagues, Mary Lou Gornel timpany from Eco Herft um, at Connecticut and UCSF. But w- w- so many of us um, at UCLA and UCSF, we're looking at all of these things, including the social emotional variables that, that go into this. 
and we're looking at genetics, what happens even before a child uh, in a risk family. Uh, we can study and see differences in the connectivity. Nadine Gab's work is on, is on that. Um, and we can look at behavioral indices that we will, of course, include in any battery of diagnosis, but also in screening. Uh, the two most common uh, phoneme awareness that others will talk so much about um, and ran, as, as uh, Ed Kamei said, that Martha Dinkel and I um, really worked very hard on understanding the speed of connection between visual and language regions. That's what the RAN is, or any good naming speed task, um, is really measuring the speed of connection between the parts that will later become central to the circuit. So the reason why it's so important in prediction is that many people don't understand that it's not just phonology, it's not just orthography, it's, it's, and all these other factors we know, but it's the speed with which visual regions or letters and words are connected to language regions. That's what the RAN really is. But it shows us that the right hemisphere um, is really holding on to, in some of our children with this, and individuals, it's holding on to tasks that would otherwise be done by a left hemisphere. So we see, and this is what's so interesting for the future of dyslexia, we see all kinds of delayed response. What, what happens when in that circuit is different. It's not only time for language processing, it is also where, where people like Jason Yateman are interested in the time even at the earliest level of visual processing for a small but probably discernible group. But here we are, 2022, we've had a lot of this knowledge for a long time. And where are we? We are still behind the ball. We are still having proficiency of only 15 to 17 percent for our children of color in grade eight. And at grade four in the NAEP results, you know, uh, sometimes up to 60 percent of our children of color are not, are not even at basic level. It's unconscionable. If we're talking about social justice, this slide we have to, we have to take very seriously. We have to have early screening, not so much early diagnosis, that, but, but that comes later. But we have to have early, early ability to see what are the risk factors and do something early on and not wait till grade two and three. And so one of my um, last PhD students, Ola Ozernoff Palchik, John Gabriella, Nadine Gabb, Elizabeth Norton, oh, there's so many people that work together on this huge prediction study. I want you to think. We wanted to see in kindergarten if we could identify different profiles. Now, I'm only going to say one minute on this, but I want you to know this is in developmental science. It's 2016, 2017. Take a picture of this because this shows us we have kids who are really doing super well. That purple line, that black line is your average child. And then you have four other lines which are aberrant. But the most unusual one is the green one, where you are never going to find that child because, unless you have a RAN or some kind of naming speed task looking at how fast the letters and, and words are connected to the linguistic uh, verbal label. We do, uh, I'll just go really quickly, we have to understand there's heterogeneity. There are about 20, 30, 20% of our kids, we have only phoneme awareness. We have a, a large percentage of our kids who have the largest percentage of dyslexic readers have multiple deficits, phoneme awareness, RAN, short-term memory. Um, but only about 20% have a pure RAN or only 20% have a pure phonology. And this stays stable uh, pretty much over time, in, um, depending on, on, of course, the teaching that goes on. But here's where I get back to my social justice issue. If by fourth grade, so many of our children of color, 61% African American, 54 Latino X, we are not getting to them in time. That's not dyslexia. That's a failure to teach them how to learn how to read fluently with comprehension. And especially fourth grade boys, are a particular area. I've worked with uh, Sean Robinson, who's Dr. Dyslexia Dude. You've got to look up his, his graphic comic books, etc. 
but I've also been very impressed by what Tracy Wheaton said, that so much of our of our of, of, of what's going on right now is to say, oh, we have to be extremely careful with our children and understand their cultural identity and the the the, the roots of, of of difference. And I could not agree more. Simultaneously, we cannot neglect the systematic teaching of children of every race, every culture, every background. This is, this is I, I, I see people starting to veer into um, to, to poles that should never exist. We must, just as, as Julie Washington, who has, who has taught me so much, as I'm sure she will be saying to you, we have to understand by dialecticalism. We have to understand all of that. But at the same time, we must never, never neglect our expectation to make every child fluent and comprehending by fourth grade. As Tracy Whedon said, there is a soft racism of reduced expectations that cannot be allowed. We cannot have wars. I want no wars between balanced or whole language and, and phonics. I want people to understand how to, to emphasize systematically, explicitly all those foundational skills. At the same time, I never want any kind of, if you will, tension between those of us who are very worried and concerned about uh, issues of children who are, have non-English backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. It never, ever must be neglecting what we know from knowledge about reading uh, for our children. This is really important because there have been so many unnecessary debates in our field. Um, I've been working with Robin Morris and Maureen Lovett now for 20 years on different forms of intervention that basically reverse engineer the reading brain. And what we learn from these studies is that there has to be explicitness on all those parts and that our research is really showing that we can make good metacognitive strategies for all these linguistic principles. I'll just say one tiny one. I'm using Rave only because it's the one that I helped create. So, but, but we use metalinguistic and metacognitive strategies to teach things like polysemy, that words have multiple meanings. But we don't say polysemy, we say a mem word. And Ms. Mim is a spider and teaches you can have as many meanings as she has legs. This is what we can do when we understand the importance of foundational skills being all of them have to be connected. And when we, when we actually do research on this, Maureen and I and Robin did randomized treat, uh, control treatment studies, which are, as you know, the gold standard and the hardest to do. What we see is that our multi-component interventions that are systematic are doing better than our programs that are just only phonics based, as good as they are, um, that when we add these um, extra components, we get better results and then effect sizes that are extraordinary. And these are research articles by, by our group. Uh, but we also see something so important that is earlier, earlier intervention is best. When we get in there at fourth, uh, fourth third grade, we, 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 we certainly can help. But when we get in there at first grade, we do so much more efficacy. And so this research is showing us that we have to be able to have an understanding of the reading brain's multiple components and that the more children know about a word from zero to five and from five to ten the more they know the more those areas of the brain that are part of the circuit are connected so we need explicit systematic intervention and instruction across all those components and that includes everything from vocabulary and morphology to syntax and of course, phoneme awareness and semantic. It's connecting all of that at the sublexical, lexical, and sentence level, sentence and story level. We neglect nothing. And so I'm really hoping for, if you will, three areas of systematic change that begin with zero to five, that have early, 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 if you will, screening for risk factors at five, and teachers train trained to use the data for early intervention that is matching the particular profile of strength and weaknesses of those children. Let no one be, be um, thinking that this is a, a matter of 
over identification and that that child will just be maintained. No, our MTSS models, our, our ongoing monitoring of, 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 of the performance, all of this comes together in that, in that moment of time when we use data at screening to pre prepare, and that's part of an OSEP grant we're doing, to prepare better, more targeted intervention. And finally, in this slide, we have to understand that our teachers in grade four to grade eight were never taught how to identify kids with dyslexia. It is no fault of their own, but we have to have professional development that goes beyond all of that. Well, I have 10 minutes more with you, and I'm going to put this completely different topic together with our understanding of the reading brain, but I do it because you're now my audience, and I, I, I want to talk about your brain too, but I want to talk about it in terms of all of us in this digital moment. And it begins this part of my origin story, if you will, but a new origin story of reading in a digital culture begins with the fact that every medium that we read on has cost and weaknesses. And it develops, it de helps develop cognitive processes. And also, it can impede the time taken for our most sophisticated process. So Patricia Greenfield was basically saying that digital reading is impressive for so many things as we know, but there's a cost to deep processing, what I call the deep reading skills. Now, those of you who, who and, and Ed mentioned that I helped found Curious Learning, I am not a Luddite. <laughs> I, I'm not technically savvy, which John Potter and Brad know by now, <laughs> but I am absolutely an advocate of the best uses of digital wisdom, of the best uses of the democratization, and have worked in Ethiopia and South Africa on devices with curious learning that help our non-literate populations. But what I am saying in this talk is that we have to look at what is diminished, what is disrupted when we are using digital technologies. And the data now from my friends like Naomi Barron, the eRead Network in Europe, and Meng, and oh, there's so many people, oh, Rockefeller Rock Ackerman, Marie Barzilai, Tommy Katsir, so many people are looking at what is happening to us. Um, and part of COVID, let's face it, gave us both extraordinary help in getting some form of education to our children through technology. But it also made the iPad a babysitter, um, uh, the, one of the go-to caretakers in the house, which has very big implications, just as Ed actually talked about with regard to my use of William Stafford. The quality of attention has been given us well, it can be taken away too. And that is a real piece of understanding. And here my colleagues, uh, John Hutton, have shown that the, if you compare the brain of a child uh, when they are listening to a story with a parent under their arm associating versus just listening to it in an audio versus seeing it on an iPad with all the bells and whistles, the, the what he calls the Goldilocks effects is that the best activation happens when a parent reads to a child in a book. Not the audio version, though the audio is better than the bells and whistles. So this is helping us understand that it's this quality of attention versus distraction and overstimulation that we're learning about in that zero to five period. Now I'm going to skip all the way to young adulthood only because I only have a few minutes left with you. But I want to use them to say that there's this huge meta-analysis of young adults who are, in a way, placeholders for us. And this analysis was simply based on studies that looked at the same, the same little novella being read on print or on screen and what happened to the comprehension it, on either medium. And without, Without a doubt, most of you will, by now will, will, will know that what I would think is that, yes, print would be superior in comprehension, and it was. But really, the story is the sub-story by Ackerman. And she was saying to this, these young people, 
which do you, which medium do you think you're better on? And they said, oh, screen, screen, screen. And why? Because they say they're faster. Well, that's the problem. The speed with which they are processing is skimming and they are missing out pieces of information that are essential for understanding what is going on in, in that particular story. But the other subplot, if you will, is even more frightening to me. No, not, not frightening, more sobering. And that is that those young adults in the study who were the last ones in the study, so this is from 2000 all the way to 2017, the last ones were the true digital natives. When you analyze their data, hmm, wonder what you're thinking is superior. I was wrong. I thought they would, you know, have become better on the screen. No, the superiority effect was even stronger for print. Again, because they thought speed was the same as understanding. And we have to understand that we, you and I, are very much like the data in that base. And uh, my letter for in, in Reader Come Home is about my own personal experience of understanding how, how I have been affected as much as everyone else. Um, but how we are affected begins with the fact that most of us are becoming absolute pros in the defense strategy of skim. Skimming is what Professor Liu in San Jose calls our new norm, and it is. What we're doing, the eye movement people show us, we're doing an F or a Z on, on the page. There's even studies in, in liter, literary studies showing that graduate students are doing the same thing with their papers, with the whole paper. Read the beginning, do, do, do a little word spotting throughout, and then the end. Well, that does not give every author the absolute attention that they have given when they have written these words. So we are guilty, if you will, of skimming the complexity and the beauty. So science and poetry are coming together. We are skimming, we are Twitter braining our way through information. It's, it's not to be unexpected. We are bombarded with information. And as a result, we do two things that are really desperately wrong. We are not looking at the perspectives of others Often, we are going to familiar silos of information where we have what is called confirmatory bias of what we thought coming into it. So we are spending less time on critical analysis, less time on empathy, less time with beauty. We do not want either beauty or truth to go missing, and yet we have to be vigilant about our own reading to ensure that we can do that across any medium, but to know the particular threat that digital culture reading can pose for us. So if we look at the potential threat part of what it could disrupt, we are giving less time to understanding the various viewpoints. We are giving less time to others, therefore the effect on empathy. We are becoming more and more susceptible to false information, disinformation, false fears, false false hopes. We are becoming, and we only have to look at the war in Ukraine and Russia and the role of disinformation there. We are all threatened by the handbook of demagoguery, which threatens the delicate game. That's what Umberto called it, Umberto Eco, called the delicate game of a democratic society. Now, I have written, and, and now I have no time and desire for you to look at my proposal as an antidote, but for those of you who are interested, I am extremely um, hopeful that we can figure this out, that we can figure out how to give especially print and learn deep reading skills on print, the first especially 10, 12 years till that child is really developing, if you will, digital wisdom along with uh, on in, on a parallel path and learning technology and deep reading. So it's putting those two together that I, 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 I'm hoping for our future. Um, and I see that as the way forward, that we are 
aiming to preserve deep reading as we expand the technological skills and knowledge and access to amazing information um, that we can have with technology. I'm going to end with two slides um, from a philosopher uh, and then a poet. <laughs> It would be catastrophic to become a nation of technically competent people who have lost the ability to think critically, to examine themselves, and to respect the humanity of others. It is therefore urgent now to be producing citizens. That's our job, who can see the different and foreign not as a threat to be resisted, but as an invitation to expand their own minds and capacity for citizenship. We can neglect no one, and our knowledge, our knowledge can help us get there. And so I'm going to end with, if you will, science meeting poetry through novel and poem. Marilyn Robinson said that the greatest test ever made of human wisdom and decency may very well come to this generation or the next. We can stop here after COVID. But then she said something that I believe is what is our, our shared goal. We must teach and learn broadly and seriously. But I give the last words to our poet laureate who, who gave the most amazing, moving, literally and figuratively moving poem for um, an inauguration, and that's our young Amanda Gorman. In this poem, she said, while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. Those of you who have come to this wonderful conference, all 4,000 of you or more, I wish you Godspeed in your work to realize it's up to us. We're the stewards, and we can do this. So I will end with one last poetic line from Patricia McGillop. The future, any future, is just one step at a time out of the human heart. I would add, out of the human heart and mind. May they be together with you throughout this conference. Thank you for coming, and thank you, John and Ed, for just the most wonderful introduction. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. That was inspiring. And uh, just looking at the comments, I think uh, everyone thought so as well. And I, I, I just appreciate your message, too, because we often hear about the importance of reading and framed as, you know, just an academic success. And it's just a test score. And, you know, that's all it is. But it's so much more than that. You know, it's being able to participate in society and having social justice and, you know, being able to, as you said, you know, tell misinformation from disinformation from, you know, it's just so much more important than a test score uh, for students. So uh, we have time for just a few questions. We got a, a number of them, but I'll kind of share a, a few of them uh, with you in our last few minutes here. Uh, we have a question, uh, one of the first questions. Uh, is zero to five the only time frame when these connected pathways uh, for language uh, are built? What does research show for how long the language portion can still be developed? Well, there's good news and bad news here. Um, we know that some of the most important growth is happening between zero and five all the way up to adolescence. Um, so we can do an enormous job of playing catch up, but we need to be serious. We need to be systematic about it. And here's where I, I wasn't able to really talk to you um, enough about our screeners. Uh, we have an Office of Special Education grant in which we are looking at screeners ourselves for the at-risk, uh, if you will, precursors during the zero to five period. We are working with pediatricians to have a, actually a questionnaire ultimately at three and then a screener at five. These screeners help identify areas inside language development that we can then work on as we move into adolescence. Now, I, I, um, I, I know that there's been all kinds of interesting research showing that we, we, we kind of begin to close our 
we, we don't ever, we're always, we always have this plasticity in our reading brain. So language is forever what we're learning. But there is, um, there is a difference, for example, in learning foreign languages. Um, one of the things that happens is that we can be very good with semantics, but that, that window with having an absolute accent-free phoneme is, 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 is just, it's closing its window around adolescence at late adolescence. This is not my area, so I don't want to be, be, be forcing that fact that I learned it the hard way um, on others, but, but that we do sense that. But I think the real point that your, your speaker or your, your, your questioner is asking is, does it close at five? Absolutely not. We can be working on that. And that's what one of the things we should be working on um, during those, those early elementary years. We can never, we, we, we never give up. And, and there's wonderful people, SERP, who are, who are uh, Catherine Snow and, and others are, are using vocabulary uh, that is central in, let's say, the middle school ages as a way of uniting disciplines. Uh, so SERP is a, a, a beautiful way of thinking about how language can be developed over time and by eighth grade really serve as this platform, this lexical platform for, for kids. Thank you. Uh, another question that came up actually in the chat, but I know this is a common question we get a lot, is um, how do you balance the science of reading uh, with culturally and historically responsive teaching? Ah, oh, this is such a beautiful question, and I and I truly try to address it somewhat. Um, my whole life, be, as a neuroscientist, began when I understood the contribution of cultural differences and cultural identity, and I, from that moment on, understood that that's a piece of understanding the the child and how to teach. So I was shocked, actually, more in the last few years that there would be a division between being culturally responsive and applying the knowledge of neuroscience or science to our teaching. The One of the, the beautiful um, translations, actually, of my RAVO program took place in Italy, and one of the, the ways they tested, and we had never tested, the effects of good solid intervention was that the, the sense of, of efficacy, the sense of identity, the sense of relationship were all being significantly improved after the intervention. And what I, what I you mean with this example is that it's never, ever should be either or. It's and. And if we separate them, I think both will, there will be a, a disservice for both. We are never teaching, well, actually, I am teaching, helping teach robots in MIT, so I shouldn't say that. But our children are not robots. They are full of characteristics that we need to understand and be responsive to, but never, never have reduced expectations because of cultural differences. That's where Tracy Wheaton's uh, uh, comment is so important. There is a soft racism of reduced expectations that I think can come when we have too much emphasis uh, uh, one way or the other. So we don't want that. Great, thank you. And we probably have time for one last quick question. Um, question here, uh, how can we best serve students with stealth dyslexia in school that don't have phonological basics, uh, but have been memorizing the whole word? So those kids that don't have the foundations, but may look okay because they've memorized enough words early on. Oh gosh, we, it's so, so funny. I, 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 I myself don't use the word stealth dyslexia. I use the word we have a heterogeneity when we when we think of dyslexia. It's not one thing, but there is no doubt that there are children out there who just simply memorize the gestalt and have never ever learned how to decode 
which will hold them in, in real trouble the rest. So one of the things that we do with the screener is discern who's doing that. Who does not have access to a phony? Who does not have the rapidity necessary to connect a letter? So we want, we are using those, those five-year-old, six-year-old screeners not to diagnose, not to over-identify, but to find out who's not doing what. So the beauty of this kind of general screener that you know we're, we're, we're working on, and there, and there will be different ones, but they have to include the ability to make just the distinction you're, you're referring to, John, so we can see those kids from the start and begin working systematically with uh, learning the alphabetic principle. We'll let Anita talk about what they need to do. No one can, oh, there's so many people in your panels who are so good at that. So I get, I get to, to stop because I must, but I get to continue it by saying, tune in to all those great panelists who will be talking to you about some of those specifics.